now that ACG week is actually done, I really hope you guys have learned quite a lot. I will not abandon the playlist, by the way. I will still post the video on the rhythm inter on the different rhythms. I'll also post videos on Test Yourself that will help you understand and interpret the ECG even much better. I thought of doing a video on carbon monoxide poisoning. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at carbon monoxide poisoning. Remember that we are currently in winter season in our particular region and it's quite cold. The temptation to actually switch on a brazier, put it in the house, close all the windows, close all the doors because you don't want air to enter in is very, very high. Carbon monoxide poisoning is very deadly. You can actually die. So remember that whenever these hydrocarbons burn, they can burn in two main ways. They can burn via what is known as complete combustion. They can burn in what is known as incomplete combustion. Complete combustion results in production of carbon dioxide, which won't really cause you much of a problem. But incomplete combustion is going to create a compound that is known as carbon monoxide, CO, what I will abbreviate as CO in this particular lecture. Remember that this carbon monoxide is odorless, it is colorless, so you may not even know that it's there. You can't even detect it with your nose. It's going to be produced from house fires and even in properly ventilated automobiles, gas heaters, furnaces, hot water heaters, wood or charcoal burning stoves, even kerosene heaters. Way back when I was in another country and the rates of suicide were quite high, how people used to actually off themselves and unsubscribe to life, they would often switch on their car, park it in the garage, seal all the vents, seal all the air spaces, sit inside the car, close the windows and plug the, the exhaust pipe with newspapers. Carbon monoxide would fill up in the car and they would actually die. That's how they would unsubscribe themselves from life. So remember that carbon monoxide is going to be produced when natural gases like methane and propane actually burn. And carbon monoxide poisoning is very lethal. It actually can kill you. So most of the poisoning and exposure is going to be through inhalation. And it's also quite worth mentioning that remember that you also do produce some carbon monoxide from tobacco smoke. Though we can't even detect this in the bloodstream, it's not enough to cause poisoning. Remember that this carbon monoxide, how it's going to be causing these clinical features and how it's going to be causing problems is that you're going to have carbon monoxide binding to hemoglobin. Remember that carbon monoxide, or rather hemoglobin, has a greater affinity for carbon monoxide than does our oxygen, about over 200 times. And once carbon monoxide is exposed to hemoglobin, it will bind to hemoglobin and displace oxygen from the molecule of hemoglobin and it forms a very stable compound, which is known as carboxyhemoglobin. In addition to this, remember that this carboxyhemoglobin is going to shift the oxygen dissociation curve to the left. What does this mean? If your curve shifts to the left, it means you need higher oxygen partial pressures for you to actually saturate your hemoglobin. So it means your hemoglobin is not going to release oxygen to the tissues. Tissues are going to be respiring anaerobically. And remember, the product of anaerobic respiration is less energy and production of lactic acid. So patients may actually be in some sort of metabolic acidosis. Carbon monoxide is also going to inhibit mitochondrial respiration and possibly even directly have a toxic effect on the brain. You shall see that in some individuals, they may actually even develop neurological or even neuropsychiatric symptoms that they may actually be present and may persist for the rest of their life and it can actually be permanent. Remember that once it's eliminated in the body, or once it's in the body rather, it's going to have an elimination half-life of about four and a half hours if the person is just breathing room air, or one and a half hours if they are on 100% oxygen, and about 20 minutes if they are in a hyperbaric chamber with three atmospheres of pressure, and they're, they're being given 100% oxygen. Though we do not have many hyperbaric chambers here in our country, actually I haven't seen any in our country here, but it's like this metal tank where you're put inside 
and the pressures could be regulated, the amount of oxygen, you create a negative pressure there, such that you're going to be flushing patients with a lot of oxygen, 100% pure oxygen. This has been used in the management of carbon monoxide poisoning, but recently there has been some controversies and on the use and it has become rather controversial. Some people actually do not even advocate for it. And some researches and some studies have actually shown that it may actually cause more harm than good. So what are some of the clinical features? Remember that if you have the carbon carboxyhemoglobin that has formed, oxygen is not going to be delivered to the tissues. Though patients may have non-specific symptoms. So you really need a high index of suspicion. What is going to give you the diagnosis, of course, would be your history. They'll have a history of having a brazier in the house. They'll have a history of being trapped in a burning building. And you have to correlate that now to the patient. Remember that some symptoms are going to be present depending on the level of carboxyhemoglobin inside the bloodstream. So for those that have levels between 10 to 20%, they may have headache and nausea, which is very common. For those that are above 20%, they'll be they, uh, they'll have this vague dizziness, they'll have generalized weakness, difficulty in concentrating, impaired judgment. For those that have levels above 30%, they may have dyspnea during exertion, they may have chest pains, especially in patients with coronary artery disease, they may be confused. Those that have high levels, they may actually faint, they may have seizures, they may have decreased levels of consciousness, they may be obtundation, they may have hypotension, they may have coma, respiratory failure, and death especially in those that have higher rates, even more than 60%. Remember that patients may also have some other symptoms like visual deficits, abdominal pain, focal neurologic deficits. And remember, if it's quite severe, they may even have neuropsychiatric symptoms and signs like dementia, psychosis, Parkinsonism, chorea, amnestic syndromes, and these can actually develop days to weeks after the exposure and they'll become permanent. So because you have this carbon monoxide poisoning that often results from these fire houses or houses that are on fire, then they may also have some other existing injuries that may be there to the airway that may also even put them at risk of respiratory failure. How do you make a diagnosis? Remember that diagnosis is largely made through the history and though we can order for some investigations. Remember that carbon monoxide poisoning will present as non-specific symptoms. Especially in winter, they'll present as features that are quite similar to a viral infection. So you'll be, to be in the background of someone that presents with these non-specific flu-like symptoms in winter. And they'll have sometimes even an unexplained metabolic acidosis. Remember, symptoms very vague, non-specific, they're variable. So your diagnosis of carbon monoxide poisoning is very easy to actually miss, such that the mild cases will present as these viral syndromes that you are going to just send the patient home away without actually having a proper diagnosis for the patient. And remember that you do not rule out the toxicity based on normal levels of uh, carbon monoxide in the body because just from you removing that exposure from that patient and putting them in natural environment with normal air, the levels of carbon monoxide are actually going to drop very quickly. There are some investigations that we could do, such as carboxyhemoglobin levels. We can use a carboxy, carbon monoxide oximeter. And remember, we usually get uh, venous blood that can be used for this because the difference between the arterial and even the venous site is actually quite minimal. You can actually neglect the difference. The levels may sometimes be falsely low because, again, remember, the once the exposure has ended, the levels of carbon monoxide in the body are going to drop quite drastically, especially if patients have actually received some form of oxygen, for example, in the ambulance. ABGs should be done, but not routinely. Remember that they will show some sort of metabolic acidosis that can be the only clue that will point you towards carbon monoxide poisoning. Remember that you cannot depend on ABGs, you cannot depend on oximetry, pulse oximetry, because the oxygen partial pressure, or rather the oxygen concentration that they give you on the ABGs is measured from that oxygen that is dissolved in the blood. Remember that the dissolved oxygen is not going to represent the oxygen that is there in the red blood cells. It's not going to represent the amount of oxygen that is uh, fully saturated. So oximetry can give you false values. You may sometimes have someone who has normal values, but they have quite significant amount of carbon monoxide poisoning. Same thing with the ABGs and the oxygen levels. 
Non-invasive carbon monoxide detectors have not been shown to be accurate and they're also not even useful in the diagnosis of carbon monoxide exposure or toxicity. You may go on to order some other investigations like an electrocardiograph if they are presenting with chest pains, a CT or an MRI if they're presenting with neurologic symptoms. How do we manage these patients? You, number one, of course, remove this patient from the source of this carbon monoxide. Educate the patient. Patient education, most important thing. Give the patient 100% oxygen via a non-rebreather mask and you treat them supportively depending on whatever they are presenting with. In some cases, there may be use of a hyperbaric oxygen therapy, putting them in a hyperbaric chamber for with the pressure of about two to three atmospheres and giving them 100% pure oxygen. This is, has become quite controversial in our setup here, but we don't even have the hyperbaric chamber. But you want to do this with patients that have life-threatening cardiopulmonary complications. You want to do it with patients that have ongoing chest pains, those that have altered level of consciousness, those that have lost consciousness, no matter how brief it is those that have carboxyhemoglobin levels greater than 25, even in pregnant women. Because remember that even at lower serum carbon monoxide levels, you want to actually treat these patients much more aggressively than the non-pregnant women because even the fetus will be affected. So remember that the hyperbaric oxygen therapy can actually decrease the incidence of delayed neuropsychiatric symptoms. However, it is also associated with barotrauma. trauma. It is associated with formation of free radicals. In our setting, like I said, we do not have this hyperbaric chambers. So if you actually need a patient that needs hyperbaric therapy, you have to consult. If you're in a place where they have hyperbaric chambers, you consult a specialist, especially if you want to put them in a hyperbaric chamber. First, do consult. How do we prevent this? Of course, we check sources in, inside the house, these combustion sources should be checked and they must be installed correctly. The house must have vents and the vents to these combustion chambers must be outside, taking the, the air outside. If it's a chimney, the chimney must be patent and all the oxygen or rather the carbon monoxide should be going outside. Cars should never be left running in a garage that is enclosed. You should also install some carbon monoxide detectors in certain areas that can actually warn you that there's some carbon monoxide poisoning wherever you are. The levels of carbon monoxide have increased. And if you do get this warning, then you should leave that area, open the windows, and of course, wait for the levels to fall down and don't go back there until the levels have fallen down to levels that are not so dangerous. Carbon monoxide poisoning is very deadly, so please make sure that you learn about it. I really hope you enjoyed that video on carbon monoxide poisoning. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.